Okay, good afternoon and Hare Krishna. Welcome to all of you for today's uh, session on uh, Shila Prabhupada Dinamutra. We'll offer prayers and then we'll start. Oma Gyanat Mirandasya Gyananjana Shilakaya Chakshodan Militam Yenatasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Stapitam Yenabhutale Swayam Rupa Gadama Hindadati Swapadantikam Mandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapadakamanam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagana Rubunatan Vitam Thams Jeeva Sadhvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Radita Sri Vishakanitam Scha Namam Vishnu Padai Krishna Prishtai Bhutale Sri Mate Jaya Pataka Swam Nikinamini Namacharya Padai and Taikta Padai and Gora Padam and Vidakam Padim Namam Vishnu Padai Krishna Prishtai Bhutale Sri Mate Gopi Paran and Dasi Tinamini Namam Vishnu Padai Krishna Prishtai Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swam Nikinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gora Vani Pachari Nushishu Nyavadi ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯಾಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣಚೈತನ್ಯಪ್ರಭುನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ್ರಿಂದ ಕಥಾಂಚನ ಸ್ಮೃತೆಯಸ್ಮಿಂದುಷ್ಕರ ಭವೇತ್ ಸ್ಮೃತಿ ವಿಪರೀತ ಸ್ಯಾತ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ವಿ ಕೇಮ್ ಅಪ್ ಟು ದ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಶಿಲ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಸಿದ್ಧಾಂತ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಠಾಕೂರ್ ಡಿಸಪಿಯರೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಾಸ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ವೀಕ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಕೋಯಿನ್ ಸೈಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಹಿಸ್ our class almost coincided with this uh, disappearance when we ended um so today we will continue post the physical disappearance of 
של הבחתי סטודנטי סג'די טאקו. Okay, so on the banks of Radha Kunda, uh, Shla Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur had said that there will be a fire in the Gaudiya Mat. Uh, the fire would come due to personal ambition. And Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur had said that he would prefer to take out the marbles from the Bhag Bazaar temple and sell them and distribute uh, books using the money that, is, uh, that comes from selling the marbles, print books, and then distribute them. So he specifically gave an instruction to Srila Prabhupada, if you ever get money, then print books. So uh, this fire in the mud, uh, which, which is already uh, in its latent phase during, not only latent, it's just to showing, showing up during Shila Bhaktisthan's Taku's time, beginning to show. Once he left, it became into a full-blown fire. What had happened was Shila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur had expressed very explicitly that in uh, uh, that his institution, Gaudiya Mat, should be run by a governing body. The concept of a governing body is completely new to any uh, Mat in India. Uh, no muts had been governed by the uh, governing body. And uh, Bhakti Santosh Thakur used the concept of governing body from Indian railways at that time, which was being run by the British. They had what is called the GBC, the Governing Body Commission. So uh, from there, Bhakti Santosh Thakur had picked up this concept of how to govern the mutt. So he had expressed it in his will accordingly. So after the disappearance of Shila uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, you had one of his prominent followers, Ananta Vasudev, who was a scholar and also a preacher, uh, who had the support of many influential sannyasis of the Gaudiya Mat. So he claimed to be the successor of Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, along with the support of some prominent uh, sannyasis. So then there was another uh, uh, devotee. Kunja Bihari, who was the principal administrator of the Gaudiya Mutt during the time of Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Now, what he did was, he said, he contested the will of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and he said, these properties that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had acquired were acquired in the name of God. So, it does not belong to him. It does not belong to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So, therefore, he cannot decide whom it should go to. So like this, uh, Kunja Bihari, he was actually the central administrator. He had control of the Bhag Bazar Gaudiya Mutt and also the Gaudiya Mutt in Mayapur. So... Uh, Ayo, Powering off. Power on. You plugged into Nirvana. Your device is ready to pair. Uh, is that on the uh, Zoom? Sorry, I could hear some voice. I don't know where it was. Okay. So, um, so the uh, Kunja Bihari, he had these two properties under his control. So, Anand Vasudev. Sorry, that was coming from the uh, from Zoom, so I've just muted him. I hope it works. Okay. Okay, so uh, 
the, so so what happened was that um, they finally went to court also and in the court one court ruled in the favor of Ananta Vasudev and then uh, uh, a higher court ruled in the favor of um, Kunjabihari. The higher court, higher court said that three-fourth of the properties could be held by Kunjabihari and one-fourth of the properties could be held by uh, Ananta Vasudev. Now, when we say three-fourth, it does not refer to just... Uh, what, what existed in Mayapur and Calcutta, rather properties span India. So they ruled that um, the higher court ruled that three-fourths of the properties can be held by Kunjabihari and one-third by Ananta Vasudev. So uh, that's what happened. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Kunjabihari, because of the legal expenses of fighting, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Chakur and four printing presses. He closed, he closed down all the four printing presses to pay for uh, the expenses of the legal case. Now, all this may appear so strange because you, here you had a Shla, a Shri, you had Shla Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Chaku, who uh, the Vaikunta man has probably called him. And in this presence, uh, he had initiated sannyasis. They were all very prominent devotees at the time of Shla Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Chaku. So how is it that something like this could happen? So uh, it's not very surprising because um, it is explained that once when an Acharya leaves, then obviously the chaos uh, descends. So that's why uh, it is commendable that this calm has prevailed um, so many years after Shri Prabhupada's disappearance. So that's why Prabhupada then hammered this point that we should have a governing body which was the desire of his own Guru Maharaj. And if, if the Gaudiya Mat, if only the Gaudiya Mat had done that, they would not have uh, disintegrated the way they did. So uh, that's just a brief summary. It spans a little into the book, but I just wanted to summarize that. Uh, in 1938, uh, we, we saw that before Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Sasri Thakur's disappearance, in Bombay, Shila Prabhupada was work, working as an agent for Smith's Institute. Uh, along with uh, trying to develop his own business. But uh, someone had complained uh, that uh, the supervisor's son, in fact, had complained along with the supervisor that Prabhupada was actually focusing on his, on his own business and he was neglecting the business of the Smith Institute. So he was fired from the Smith Institute and he was struggling. So then uh, Prabhupada, in 1938, he decided, he decided to return to Calcutta. And when he came to Calcutta, he uh, stayed at, uh, he took a place on, at uh, 6 Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane. Now, this, those of you who know Calcutta, this is not Calcutta, near Shambhazar. Uh, he, in fact, rented two buildings, uh, 6 Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane and 7 Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane. In Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane, 6, number 6, he, on the first floor was his office and the second and third floor were his residences. And on 7th, uh, on 7th Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane was his, uh, first floor was his new uh, chemical factory. And uh, second and third floors were empty. Now, during this time, what Prabhupada did, he established what is called Abhay Charan Day and Sons. Established his own business. Previously, he was working as an agent for Bose Laboratory, and uh, he was trying to. Uh, uh, I mean, now no more as an agent. He started his own uh, manufacturing, and he was also trying to work as an agent of Smith Institute while trying to develop his own products. So now he gave up working as an agent for anyone, and uh, he just began to develop his own uh, products. And there is good success. Uh, he could give his thing to Bengal Chemical and other places. There was demand. And Prabhupada recollects an incident with uh, bottle merchant Abdullah. Abdullah was a Muslim man and he had become rich by selling glass bottles. There's something which Prabhupada mentions about uh, this thing which we need to take note of. Okay, before that, uh, before, bottle, uh, before the uh, bottle merchant there is uh, what people 
uh, at Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane when Prabhupada was saying what they had to say. Shanti Mukherjee is a neighbor from nearby Bihari Street. He was interested only in devotional activities. This is about Prabhupada. And he did his business only to maintain the family. He didn't seem interested in the profit motive in accumulating money or becoming a rich man. Now there's Chandi Mukherjee. Now there's also Charan Mukherjee. This is Abhai's next door neighbor. Abhai Charan Day was always a very patient listener to every illogical argument that anybody, including myself, would bring to him. So Prabhupada was a very patient listener, even to illogical arguments. Uh, very interesting. Not knowing philosophy, I would illogically present so many arguments. And Mr. Day would always very patiently listen. Nothing agitated him. He was always very calm and he taught me about God. He would speak only of Krishna, he was translating the Gita was, and was maintaining his uh, business. Uh, so, so that's the impression of people who had, who lived uh, close to Abhai, close to Aushila Prabhupada during those days. The impression that they had he was mainly focused on uh, Krishna, but he was doing business for the sake of maintaining his family. And Prabhupada recollects an incident with bottle merchant Abdullah, as I mentioned a little earlier. Abdullah was a glass merchant uh, who became rich by selling glass bottles. And so Prabhupada once asked him, this Prabhupada also recollects this in a lecture, that once when uh, Prabhupada asked him this question, what will you do, Abdullah, that now that you have so much money? So what will you do with the money that you're accumulating? So, Prabhupada, so Abdullah res responded by saying that one day I'll build a mosque. So Prabhupada in the lecture also, he makes the point very nicely. that this is how people thought in the previous, during his time, you know, that uh, they had that desire, they had that piety to, uh, to dedicate their life earning in glorification of God. But uh, that's definitely not the situation today. Today, nobody who earns things in those things on those lines. They would rather think in terms of uh, buying properties on exotic islands and uh, I mean going on uh, on a cruise or whatever else. But uh, during those days, people were still had some amount of piety. So uh, I mean, even today nobody thinks like this that. I want to earn money to build a temple. Nobody thinks like that. Or build a mosque in this particular instance. Uh, further collapse of the Gaudiya Mutt. I think I've already covered this. Uh, because uh, this just refers to the uh, selling of the uh, selling of the um, printing presses and so on. Completely uh, collapsed. And in fact, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, there, in fact, uh, not only court fight, there are also fist fights uh, between the two factions. Okay. Now, uh, when Prabhupada was at uh, Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane, uh, his god brother, Sridhar Maharaj, had sent some um, brahmacharis from Mayapur. He had an ashram in Navadvi. So he sent some. Uh, Devotees. Now, why did he have an ashram? Because by the time that the uh, so by that by that time, very shortly after these factions started warring, two factions of Anantavas Dev and Kunji Bihari collapsed in the sense that okay, I forgot to mention this instance. Uh, when they started fighting, then uh, uh, several god brothers became disillusioned with the two factions and began their own muts so that they could peacefully try to execute. Uh, the mission of Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Sashri Thakur. Uh, practically, the whole uh, thing collapsed when Ananta Vasudev, he ran off with a woman. So Ananta Vasudev, as, as I mentioned earlier, was the one who had the support of many Gau prominent sannyasis of the Gaudiya Mutt. But when he ran off with a woman, even those supporters whom he had became fragmented. So, so from Gaudiya Mutt, there came many entities uh, such as the Gaudiya Mission, uh, Chaitanya Gaudiya Mart, and so on. Several missions uh, came up. Now, when Prabhupada is staying at 6 Sita Kanta Banerjee Lane, um, Sridhar Maharaj, from his, because he had also started his own mutt because of not being able to uh, 
handle the situation with all these different between the two warring factions he he wanted to peacefully establish uh, mat and continue the preaching of continue to preach the uh, continue to carry out the mission of labakthis and the sri takur so uh, he sent some brahmacharis to prabhupada's place in 6th tapanda banaji lane and when they came back they reported to uh, um um chidar maharaj that uh, there is good prospect of uh, by helping us so then uh, subsequently prabhupada as i said 7th sita kanta banaji lane was uh, was for uh, his factory the first floor second and third floor were empty so proper decides to uh, rent those rooms to the uh, sridhar maharaj group which come com- com- essentially the sridhar maharaj bakti sarang maharaj and puri maharaj so he decided to give it out to them on rent for 20 rupees a month okay let's go there Uh, so what happened was that okay he gives them out for twenty rupees a month and now that place right next to Prabhupada's own house was frequented by uh, Bhakti Sarang Maharaj, Puri Maharaj, and uh, Shridhar Maharaj and the Brahmachari would stay there. Of course they would cook their own uh, uh, they would cook boga, offer it to the Lord, have their own prasadam, and they had their own puja. And Prabhupada continued to uh, have his prasadam and his uh, Uh, have his prasadam at his own house, but he would join them. He would join uh, the the sannyasis and the brahmacharis who were going out when they would go out for preaching. Prabhupada would join, and as he was an expert bridanga player, and sometimes when Sri Dhar Maharaj was ill, Prabhupada would not only play bridanga but he would also give the lectures, Sri Mad Bhagavatam lectures. Now, nineteen thirty nine was the time when Prabhupada. began to uh, start his uh, writing activities as to fulfill the instruction of shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur so 1939 is a very important year where he started this effort by writing what is called introduction to gita upanishad so i'll read this this is a Little bit long section, and then you'll have an even more longer section a little later. But it's so important, so I just put it as the test. This is what Robert did in the uh, introduction to Gita Upanishad. In his introduction, Abhay reflected on the time when, as a young school boy, he had attended a lecture, Vidya Ratna, the jewel of education. The theme of the lecture had been that God does not exist and could not exist. if there were god he would certainly have appeared on earth to put an end to all religious rivalry but since god had not obliged man in this way we should banish all thought of his existence from our minds the audience abai explained consisting only of so many boys did not delve deeply into the subject matter of the le- lecture yet the majority impressed by the arguments carried away lofty ideas of godlessness and thus became agnostics at home abai had not been satisfied with the agnostic conclusion because i had been trained by my father to be engaged in the worship of shri shri radha govinda but as a result of the vidya ratna lecture i was experiencing some mental conflict between agnosticism and the existence of god and later having heard from a spiritual master shri bhakti siddhanta Abai understood that the personality of God exists in every sphere of activity, but we do not have the eyes to see Him. Abai wrote, "Even if the Lord personally manifests Himself on earth, the quarrelling mundaneers will not stop their fighting and look upon God at or as representative due to ignorance. This is the birthright of the individual soul by the grace of God." Bhagavad Gita is the true jewel of education. and in the gita lord krishna declares to the fighting people on earth here i am do not quarrel uh suhrdam sarva bhutana yes. okay uh the agnostic who had spoken of the jewel of education had been blinded by the jewel and therefore could not see and appreciate the personality of god and thus he had gone on to convince others to become so called jewels also 
Following a spiritual master, Abhai displayed an aggressive spirit for confronting all opponents of pure theism. In responding to a spiritual master's order to develop into an English preacher, Abhai was not simply making neutral scholarly presentations. He was willing and ready to fight, whether against modern agnostics or Vaishnavism's old traditional enemy, Maya Vada impersonalism. Now, this is something which we need to note that you don't find anywhere, anywhere, any place, the Prabhupada makes neutral scholarly presentations. His spirit is very clear. It's the same as the Bhagavatam. The scripture distinguishes reality from illusion. So this is exactly what Prabhupada does in his books, in his lectures. He presents what is illusion, what is reality. He just doesn't speak only about reality. He speaks about illusion, and reality simultaneously. So uh, he speaks strongly against being absorbed in the illusory engagements of this world. And he speaks about, strongly about being the need to be engaged in the uh, real spiritual, uh, engaged in real life, which is spiritual engagement. Although few saw scholars thought the way of surrender to Lord Krishna as exposed in Bhagavad Gita, almost all respected Bhagavad Gita as presenting the essence of all knowledge. The Gita, therefore, was the perfect vehicle for confronting those who misrepresented God and religion. The Gita was a challenge to the agnostics, apotheists, anthropomorphists, impersonalists, henotheists, pantheists, and absolute monists. Although there were already more than 600 commentaries in Bhagavad Gita, they had been written by persons with an inner hatred for the personality of God. Note that whenever these quotations are coming, the Prabhupada's own words, they have been written by persons with an inner hatred for the personality of God and therefore they were imperfect. Such envious persons, Abhay wrote, have no entrance into the real meaning of Bhagavad Gita in as much as a fly cannot enter into the covered jar of honey. Now, uh, this is very important that uh, we need to know that, that anyone who is not in the Vaishnava line who writes in the Bhagavad Gita is an act of envy, is an act of envy. Now, this may be very difficult to understand, but it is a fact because the symptom of non-envy is surrender unto the Lord. The symptom of non-envy is to surrender unto the Lord. So, one who is not surrendered to the Lord is envious, whether it be Mahatma Gandhi or Radha Krishna or anybody else who is commented on the Bhagavad Gita without surrendering to Krishna, are all envious. It's are all envious. That's it. They're covering their envy uh, in different forms. That's all. They're presenting it in different forms. But uh, unless a person becomes free from envy, that's why the Bhagavatam is considered as the book for Parama Nirmatsaranam Satam. It's for the Nirmatsarana, those who are non-envious. So non-envious means devotee. Only a devotee can be non-envious. This we should be convinced of the fact. No matter what words they may use, no matter how uh, how how uh, how how so-called good they may be. So there are people who do a lot of social service. They all they do lots of things. I mean, with the, which are considered pious within the material world. But every one of them is an envious person. This is the teaching of the Bhagavatam. And this is exactly what Prabhupada is uh, trying to say here. Now, normally, you don't find anyone saying things like this. That uh, anyone who has not surrendered to Krishna is an envious person. Prabhupada is writing this. Such envious persons have no entrance into the uh, real meaning of Bhagavad Gita. So, Prabhupada is very, very strong about it. He always um, read, I mean, defeated illusion. That is the nature of a sadhu. Sadhu means one who cuts. Cuts what? Cuts through the illusion. And this is the Saraswata line. Abhai described Indian culture as an almost impassable ocean due to its depth of thought and apparent mixtures of conclusions. But in this book, Abhai declared, I will establish that Krishna is the absolute personality of God. By referring to the available records of scriptures, which are recorded history of Indian culture and thought. Now, when 
Prabhupada's god brother, Sridhar Maharaj and others, uh, read this. Uh, his god brother, Bhakti Saranga Maharaj, conferred the title Bhakti Siddhanta on Srila Prabhupada because he had presented this introduction to Gita Upanishad very nicely. However, Sridhar Maharaj objected to that and uh, he said that since uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta uh, was, uh, that the title Bhakti Siddhanta was conferred to their Guru Maharaj, it was not appropriate to confer that title on Srila Prabhupada. Therefore, the, the title Bhakti Vedanta was suggested and that was the final title that was given to uh, Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada gratefully acknowledged it. Now, this is the beginning of Srila Prabhupada's efforts, 1939 article, Introduction to Gita Upanishad. Let us not forget this. This is an important landmark. This 1939 article is the beginning of Srila Prabhupada's efforts to uh, propagate the teachings of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati so, Thakur propagate the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu across the whole world. Okay, now there are some interesting historical events. Uh, well, interesting or you could say uh, appalling uh, uh, or very, uh, very tragic events that occurred in the world at that time. September on the sub, on the 3rd of September 1939, Lord Lilith Gaur, he was the Viceroy of India at that time. He declared that India was at war with Germany. Uh, so uh, what, the, what the British did as a strategy for war was that uh, they had only about 175,000 Indians in the uh, army. Now, if you declare war, you need a lot of people to fight. So what they did was they, they enrolled uh, soldiers from Punjab and Nepal, the Gurkhas and the uh, what do you call them? The, what do they call the Sikhs, the Sikhs and the Gurkhas. So because they're very tough fighters, the Punjabis and the Gurkhas are very strong fighters. And what they would do was they would they would offer them a good amount of money because uh, India was a poor country because of the British rule. They kept all the riches with themselves. And uh, so, so uh, what happened was that uh, uh, they were, the people in general were not in an economically affluent situation. So they would easily uh, join the army. Um, so from a mere strength of 175,000 soldiers, uh, the soldier count went up to 2 million. Went up to 2 million uh, in short time. Now, uh, during this phase, you, you had what is called... Um, um, okay, you had what is called the uh, Quit India Movement, which Gandhi initiated at that time because he realized that this, this whole... Uh, episode of Indians being recruited to fight for uh, the British, we could, uh, I mean, could be used as an opportunity to gain independence. So, Prabhupada, sorry, so, so Gandhi came up with this Quit India movement. And however, uh, more than that, something, there is something else which startled the British, which Prabhupada recollects later on, that there's something which startled the British, which was Prabhupada's college mate, Subhash Chandra Bose. He went and met Hitler and uh, he made a pact with Hitler that the Indians who were being recruited by the British to fight against Germany. When the Germans captured those Indians, you know, he uh, made a pact with uh, Germany, with Hitler, that these soldiers would be released to Subhash Chandra Bose, who had his army in Singapore. So, and then he would attack, the plan was to attack India from the north. So, to displace uh, displaced the British in India through force. Uh, however, he was not very happy with the uh, with the outcome of what Hitler was giving, conceding to him. So then he also made a pact with Tojo, who was the ruler of Japan, uh, to also give soldiers. Um, the British were at war with uh, with uh, with uh, Germany, with Japan, and things like that. So the British planes would uh, go and bomb China, Japan, and all these places. 
So uh, whenever the Japanese or the Germans capture Indians, the deal that uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose had made was to free them for Shubhash Chandra Bose, uh, Indian Nationalist Army, INA. You know. So um, um, it, it, it probably actually attributed India's independence to this Subhash Chandra Bose effort, effort of Subhash Chandra Bose. Although it is popularly known as known that Gandhi uh, got India independence, but Prabhupada said that actually it was uh, Subhash Chandra Bose because of his efforts uh, of the Indian National Army, due to which uh, the British eventually uh, gave up uh, India. So uh, what had happened was that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Japan and Germany and all these allies, they were fighting, uh, I don't know if they called allies, but anyway, that team of people, they were fighting uh, with the Brit with British and uh, Japan had reached as far as Burma. Now Burma is the next door border of West Bengal. So what they did was, what the British did was what's called the denial policy. It's like uh, if the British if the uh, Japanese enter into Bengal, then they would get all the grains and all the uh, wealth of Bengal. So what they did was they started destroying the boats which would transport goods and they also started destroying all the crops. So it was a famine was created, artificial famine, but just by destruction of the uh, crops. So that is the policy of the British, the denial policy. And when this artificial famine was created, and this artificial famine was created, uh, it became a very difficult situation for people of uh, India. And, but despite being, uh, but despite being um, in that situation, but despite being in that situation, um, what had happened was that the poor people of India were still, they, they, um, they did not resort to stealing and all these uh, all these uh, criminal acts. So Prabhupada speaks about it. It's interesting. Prabhupada speaks about it. Sri Prabhupada, I've got experience. The government created artificial famine. The war was going on. So Mr. Churchill's policy was to keep the people in scarcity. So they would volunteer to become soldiers. So this policy was executed. Big men, they collected the rice. Rice was selling at 6 rupees per mound. All of a sudden, it came to 50 rupees per mound. I was in the grocery shop purchasing. And all of a sudden, the grocer said, no, no, I'm not going to sell anymore. At that moment, the price was 6 rupees per mound. So suddenly, he was not going to sell. A few hours later, I went back to purchase. And the rice had gone up to 50 rupees per mound. Uh, it's almost eight times, more than eight times. The government appointed agents began to purchase the rice and other commodities which are daily necessities. They can offer any price because the currency is in their hands. They can print so-called papers, $100 and pay. Man becomes satisfied thinking, oh, I have $100, but it is a piece of paper. That was the policy. You have no money, no rice. So another avenue is open. Yes, you can become a soldier. You get so much money. People out of poverty would go there. I have seen it. No rice was available in the market. And people were hungry. They were dying. Sri Prabhupada continues. One American gentleman was present at that time. He remarked, people are starving in this way. In our country, there would have been revolution. Yes, but the people of India are so trained, the people of India, are so trained that in spite of artificial famine, they did not commit theft, stealing others' property. People were dying. Still they thought, all right, God has given. That was the basic principle of Vedic civilization. You know, so uh, that is the point. That uh, Ishopanishad's first verse speaks about one should be, uh, sorry, not the first one. The Ishopanishad, uh, uh, what is it, speaks about the principle of what should, uh, that we should be satisfied with whatever is set aside as our quota. So this is how, uh, how the, uh, the, whole, the whole Vedic culture hinged on this point. 
that uh, we should be satisfied with whatever is set aside as our quota. So even during the artificial famine, Prabhupada explains that people do not feel inclined to uh, inclined to steal because they knew this concept of dependence on God. Okay, so now uh, Prabhupada explains that because uh, the British were sending planes and bombing Japan, China and other places, the Japanese also started bombing Calcutta because they were close to Calcutta. And uh, from Calcutta, there are many, near Calcutta, there are many airstrips, including we had an airstrip in Dubulia, which is about uh, 10 kilometers from Mayapur. We had a full functional uh, airstrip during the British days. Now it's not functional. People have built shops on that airstrip. Uh, I think devotees are trying to get it to see if small planes can land in uh, near Mayapur for uh, when the TOE becomes up. Uh, so uh, they had airstrips, so they, they were using these airstrips to send bombs, to send uh, planes to bomb Japan, China, and other uh, countries in this region. So, uh, so they, they obviously you can expect retaliation. And the retaliation, the first place to retaliate would be Calcutta. So the retaliation happened, and uh, in fact, Prabhupada mentions that uh, uh, that some people thought actually it is not the Japanese retaliating; it is actually Subhash Chandra Bose is doing something, because when when Calcutta was bombed, it was only the European quarters which were bombed, whereas Indian quarters were all Indian section was all spared of it. So, so it was likely that Subhash Chandra Bose was the one who was bombing. Calcutta, especially the European section of Calcutta. Now, there's an important thing about this bombing incident, which Prabhupada relates. The whole Calcutta became vacant. Perhaps only myself and a few others remained. I sent my sons to Naudvi. Of course, my daughter was married. My wife refused to go out of Calcutta. She said, I'll be bombed, but I will not go. So I had to remain in Calcutta. I have seen bombing in Calcutta all night. I was just eating when there was the siren. So the arrangement was that in your house would be the shelter room. I was hungry. So I finished eating. Then I went to the room and the bombing began. She came. I was thinking that this was also Krishna in another form. That form was not very lovable. So the Krishna in 1945 had come in the form of the bomb. In uh, 2020, Krishna has come in the form of a virus called SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> so, but Prabhupada is saying it's a form of Krishna, not a very lovable form though. So, similarly, the SARS-CoV-2 is a form of Krishna, not very lovable though. Okay, now the next section, I would like you to hear, pay attention to this section because it's a long section, but you can clearly see the dynamics of uh, publishing there. What Prabhupada does, what, what are his thoughts at that time? Uh, he's articulated. So I, I, I could not skip this section because this is a very important section. Prabhupada said, if you really want to know me, read my books. So books are the heart of Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, Books are my personal ecstasy. So this section deals with what he did in 1944. What were his thoughts? What was what were his ideas of publishing? You know, so it's very important for us to give careful attention to this section so that we understand the 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 heart of Shla Prabhupada. What exactly the mood, the vibration of uh, Shla Prabhupada? Because this was a time of war, and what better time to preach Krishna consciousness than during war when people are looking for solutions. Similarly, what better time to preach Krishna consciousness than when there is a virus ravaging the planet? Okay. Um, in some sections here are Satsurup Maharaj's direct writings and uh, some are Prabhupada's quotations. So anyway, we'll read it. From his front room at 6 Sita Kanta Banerjee, Lane, Abai conceived, wrote, edited, and typed the manuscript for a magazine. This is not easy huh? to conceive. Those of us who are writers will know this. It's not easy to conceive, write, edit, and type. 
manuscript for a magazine. He designed a logo, a long rectangle across the top of the page. In the upper left-hand corner was a figure of Lord Chaitanya, effulgent with rays of light, like rays from the sun. In the lower right were silos of a crowd of people in darkness, but grouping to receive light from Lord Chaitanya. And between Lord Chaitanya and the people, the title unfurled like a banner, back to Godhead. In the lower right corner was a picture of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati seated at his writing, looking up thoughtfully as he composed. Above the logo ran the motto, Godhead is light, nescience is darkness. Where there is Godhead, there is no nescience. Below the logo were the following lines, edited and founded under the direct order of his divine grace, Sri Srimad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada by Mr. Abhay Charande. Abhay had already gained some printing experience in connection with his business. And after completing the manuscript, he brought it to Saraswati Press, the best printers in Bengal. He also hired an agent, Calcutta's Calcutt prestigious booksellers, Thacker, Spink and Company, who take responsibility for distributing the journal to bookstores and libraries including outlets in several foreign countries. But he went to, when he went to buy paper, he met with government restrictions. Because of the war and the subsequent paper shortage, they wanted to assay what he had written in terms of the national deeds during this time of world crisis. An ordinary citizen's religious newspaper was hardly top priority. Abai's request for paper was perfunctorily denied, but he persisted. He appealed that using paper to print the teachings of the personality of God it was not a waste, not untimely in the present troubled atmosphere. Finally, he obtained permission to print his first edition of Back to God, a 44-page publication. Abai greeted his readers by defining his motto, Godhead is light, nescience is darkness, when man forgets that he is the son of God and identifies himself with the body, then he is in ignorance. He is like a man who is very concerned with the automobile's mechanism, yet with no knowledge of the uh, driver. The defect of the present civilization is just like that. This is actually the civilization of nescience or illusion. And therefore, civilization has been turned into militarization. Mm -hmm. Everyone is fully concerned with the comforts of the body and everything related to the body. And no one is concerned with the spirit that moves the body. Although even a boy can realize that the motor car mechanism has little value if there is no driver of the car. This dangerous ignorance of humanity is a gross nescience and has created a dangerous civilization in the form of militarization. This militarization, which in softer language is nationalization, is an external barrier to understanding human relations. Now, this is a very, very important point that Prabhupada is making. You know, this militarization, which in softer language is nationalization, is an external barrier to understanding human relations. Now, which this is something very important for us to understand. This Prabhupada is bringing up this theme right there in 1944. And this is a theme that Prabhupada brought up again and again and again in his preaching. Like uh, once when Prabhupada is going on his uh, morning walk, there are some dogs, very ferocious dogs, uh, pets of some uh, people, from rich people. So they were walking their dogs and the dogs would bark at them, bark at them. Prabhupada would look at the dogs and say, immigration department. <laughs> so Prabhupada is very, very, very uh, quite unhappy Prabhupada just didn't like the immigration department because when he would try to enter some country, he didn't like the behavior of the immigration officers. So just like the dogs, they are very street conscious. They are very territory conscious. So you enter, some other dog enters into the territory, they start fighting, fighting like crazy. You know, so uh, Prabhupada said, this mentality of this is my country, that, this, that is your country, this is, this is dog mentality. You know, this is the dog mentality of this territorial, uh, the moment someone has a territorial consciousness, uh, it, it is immediately an impediment to human relationship. That is the point. 
the proper is trying to make because in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says this very clearly that Bhukta uh, Ram Yajnata Basam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram that the first and that the and and Surdam Sarva Bhutanam Jnatva Maham Shanti Rachati. So, uh, which means that the, the, the formula for peace, the formula for human race, Shantim, this Jnatva, this knowledge is very important for peace. The knowledge that the country doesn't belong to us. The body itself doesn't even belong to us. So, uh, this the, the, the territorial consciousness uh, is an impediment for uh, human relations. There is no meaning in a fight where the parties do fight only for the matter of different colored dresses. There must be therefore an understanding of human relation without any consideration of the bodily designation or colored dresses. Back to Godhead is a feeble attempt by the undersigned under the direction of his divine grace, Sri Srimad, Bhakti Siddhanta, Saraswati, Goswami, Prabhupada, the celebrated founder and organizer of the Gaudiya Mutt activities, just to bring up a real relation of humanity. There it is, with the central relation of the Supreme Personality of God. So the real relation of humanity with central relation, if that is brought up, if that is established, then uh, all these territorial consciousness breaks down. And then there can be peace uh, across the whole world. That there is a great and urgent need of literature like this is keenly felt by the leaders of all countries. And the following statements will help much in the procedure. Uh, now, Prabhupada are actually keeping track of what exactly was going on in the world. And he was not looking at it for the sake of news. Like Prabhupada explains in the Bhagavatam that we're all anxious about news, right? We want to hear different things. They're all, it's all a symptom of the modes of material nature, Rajoguna and Tamoguna. You know? But Prabhupada's looking at the world news is how shall I benefit the world? You know? So that is a different way of trying to uh, keep track of the news. It's very, very different than what ordinarily happens uh, among devotees. Unless what is advanced, one will just one will not be able to look at news from the point of view of Paropaka. One will just look at it as to satisfy one's curiosity to know different things. You know, the mode of passion and ignorance. Uh, it was 1944 and Abai specifically addressed the crisis of world war. The world's political leaders were expressing their disgust at their people's suffering and scarcity. After four years of fighting, costing millions of human lives. The Second World War, within 20 years, was still scourging the earth. Although the end was in sight, leaders expressed not so much happiness and hope as weariness and uncertainty. Even if this war ended, would there be yet another war? Because already this is the Second World War. Would there be a Third World War? Had man not yet grasped the vital lesson of how to live in peace? Abai quoted the Archbishop of India. India, guided by God, can lead the world back to sanity. He quoted the President of the United States, a program, therefore, of moral rearmament. For the world cannot fail to lessen the dangers of armed conflict. Such moral rearmament, to be most highly effective, must receive support on a worldwide basis. He mentioned former President Herbert Hoover, who had affirmed that the world needs to return to moral and spiritual ideals. And he quoted a resolution by the British House of Commons, affirming that spiritual principles are the common heritage of all people and that men and nations urgently need to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. He quoted Wendell Milky, who, after his return from Russia, had reported millions of Russians killed, millions wounded or missing in the war, and millions more suffering from a winter of terrible scarcity and subjugation. What is true for the Russian people, Abai Road, is also true for other people. And we Indians are feeling the same scarcity, the same want, and the same disgust. He quoted Britain's Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, who had been filled with lamentation and indignation at the miseries of war. He quoted the Archbishop of Canterbury, in every quarter of earth, men long to be delivered from the curse of war and to find in a world which has regained its peace, respite from the harshness and bitterness of the world they have known till now. 
but so often they want the kingdom of God, heaven without its king the kingdom of god without god and they cannot have it our resolve must be back to god we make plans for the future for peace amongst the nation and for civil security at home that is quite right enough and it would be wrong to neglect it but all our plans will come to shipwreck on the rock of human selfishness unless we turn to god back to god that is the chief need of england and of every uh, nation now this question of attaining kingdom of heaven without its king or the kingdom of god without god proper i was hearing a lecture yesterday morning the proper explains that uh, uh, we, we know that uh, the the karmis they are trying to lord it over material nature right uh, so so they are trying to enjoy they are trying to dominate material nature that's the karmi then you have the gyanis who are trying to merge into the existence of the supreme lord so uh, prabhat says that my efforts i mean the the the, the mayavadi things my efforts to control material nature to dominate material nature has not been successful therefore let me now try to become god so that is like the best form of domination right so that that is the point that is being brought up here the kingdom of god without god means the the mentality that one should serve the mentality one should serve god is missing because even the so called mayava that's why they are not glorified they uh, bhakti vinod thakur one place writes that he uh, he could stay with the uh, worst sinner but not with the mayavadi mayavadis are the most envious personalities on planet earth they are the most envious personalities on planet earth they may be detached from material sense gratification so what attachment and renunciation are two sides of the same coin the two sides of the same coin they have value only in relationship with bhakti otherwise it is mundane it is completely mundane so uh, renunciation produced from bhakti has value but renunciation for for the sake of becoming one with god that is as mundane as attachment of the karmis so in fact the mayavadis are the perfect epitome of the most envious people okay uh, he also quoted sir francis young husband of britain now that religion is everywhere attacked brutally we look to india the very home of religion for a sign and finally he quoted the sir sarvapalli radhakrishna if you notice robert actually scanning the news to try to convert it into uh, a spiritual message and finally he quoted Shri, sir sarvapalli radhakrishna this war when it would be won would prove to be the breeding ground of other wars with if the peace was not saved it could happen only if powerful nations cease to take pride and glory in their possessions which are based on labor and tribute of other weaker nations this perhaps is what sir cotcourt butler meant when he said that the principles of hinduism contain the essential elements for save for the saving of world civilizations and another quote from dr radhakrishnan abai offered a statement he also used as one of the mottos of the magazine we have to defeat tyranny in the realm of thought and create a will for world peace instruments for training the mind and educating human nature should be used to develop a proper social outlook without which institutional machinery was of little use so the 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 the, the element of training the mind and educating human nature you know that is what krishna consciousness is all about so that's why proper liked it very much train the mind and educate human nature abai expressed his confidence that the spiritual resources of india could be used by everyone not only to enhance the glories of glory of india but to benefit the whole world next he told how he had come to begin back to god at magazine how he had written a letter two weeks before the disappearance of shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati and how his spiritual master 
and instructed him to preach in English. Under the circumstances, since 1936 up to now, I was simply speculating whether I should venture this difficult task and that without any means and capacity. But as none have discouraged me, I have now taken courage to take up the work. But at the present moment, my conscience is dictating me to take up the work, although the difficulties are not over for the present situation arising out of war conditions. So even though the war conditions are there, Prabhupada had heard from his spiritual master, from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, that there is no scarcity of anything in this world. The only scarcity is Krishna consciousness. So Abhai stated that his paper would contain only the transcendental messages of the great sages of India, especially Lord Chaitanya, and that his duty would be simply to uh, repeat them. Just like a translator, he would not manufacture anything. And so his words would descend as transcendental sound for guiding people back to God. He admitted that the subject matters of back to God and being from a totally different sphere of consciousness might seem dry to his readers. But he held that anyone who actually gave attention to his message would benefit. Sugar candy is never sweet to those who are suffering from the disease of the bile. But still, sugar candy is the medicine for bilious patients. The taste of sugar candy would gradually be revived if the bilious patient goes on taking sugar candy regularly for the cure of the disease. We recommend the same process to the readers of Back to Garden. So, uh, what Prabhupada did was Explain nicely with Satsurup Maharaj here. Abhai focused on presenting the timeless message of the Vedas, but in the context of current crisis. So in the Back to God magazine, you have a section called the Vedic Observer. This is the idea. To, to uh, present the timeless message of the Vedas in the context of current crisis. In this essay, God and his potentialities, he presented Vedic evidence and logical arguments to explain the transcendental nature of Godhead and the individual souls, both being deathless, blissful, and full of knowledge. Because men have forgotten and neglected their vital connection with God, they can never be satisfied in the material world, which is temporary and beset with unavoidable miseries. As spirit souls, everyone is eternal by nature. And therefore, everyone tries to avoid the onslaught of distresses and dangers, which come one after another. But the material body meant for suffering and ultimately for destruction. So as we read these uh, 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 read these things, we can we can uh, we can we can we can remember that uh, in this material world, distresses and dangers are going to come one after the after another. So today it is SARS COVID two. Tomorrow it may be something else. This is going to continue ad infinitum. So what is it that the members of the Krishna Consciousness Movement can give to the world is that we are not the body. So we are not afraid of SARS-CoV-2. COVID of course, uh, not being afraid does not mean you're stupid. Not that we don't take any precaution not to fall sick. But the idea is uh, sick or no sick. Still, COVID is just another feature of material life. And Krishna, in a not very lovable form, but we will continue carrying on our duty fearlessly. So this is the message that the Krishna Conscious Movement can give to the world and the, at, during the times of this uh, pandemic. The message of fearlessness. Otherwise, we would be just like anybody else because the Karmis, they see there is a distress. They're trying to seek a remedy for that distress. They're afraid. They're afraid. right? They're afraid of SARS-CoV-2. They're trying to take shelter in uh, vaccinations or medical science, whatever it may be. And devotees, if they are also afraid, it takes shelter of Krishna. Oh, we are to take shelter of Nasangadev. SARS CoV 2 is there. Right? That's good. Devotees have to take shelter of Krishna at all times. That's just a preliminary level of Krishna consciousness. The real higher level of Krishna consciousness is that we are fearless. Okay, we have to continue with our duties. Whatever are our duties, we have to continue with our duties. 
without being fearless. The finest example in our Krishna conscious movement was set by His Holiness Bhakti Chara Swami, who, although took a lot of precautions while in Ujjayi, and he continued to take precautions while traveling, nevertheless, he, he gave up his life for the sake of uh, executing this duty. This is the finest example of fearlessness. Uh, what, what, what could match that example? This is what the Krishna Council movement is meant to teach the world. Fearlessness, no matter what, we will prosecute our business of Krishna consciousness. We will not get overwhelmed by the onslaught of distresses and dangers. Then people will see, these people are extraordinary. These people are extraordinary. Look at them. They are able to be happy even amidst distresses and uh, dangers. Again, I am not saying that we should be stupid. I am not saying that we should not take precautions. Taking precautions, even the, even the uh, bold people take precautions. But bold people take precautions not because they are afraid. Bold people take precautions because they don't, be, don't want to do something stupid. They don't want to give up the opportunity to attain perfection. The material body offers an opportunity to attain perfection. They take a precaution because they don't want to do something stupid. They are not taking precautions because they are afraid. That is the difference. Whereas materialists do these things because they are afraid. We take precautions because we don't want to do something which is stupid. So, exodus of the residents of Calcutta to other places out of fear of being raided by the Japanese bombs is due to the same tendency of non-destructible existence. So, again, this is the point that Prabhupada is trying to make. The, 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 the point of fear comes because we think we are destructible. The moment we, we are situated on the spiritual platform, fear vanishes. But those who are thus going away do not remember that even after going away from Calcutta, saved from the rage of the Japanese bombs, they are unable to protect their bodies as non-destructible in any part of the material universe. And the same bodies will be raided by the bombs of material nature in the form of threefold misery. So there is no escape. There is no escape from the virus called Bavaroga, the virus of death or virus of, uh, yeah, or whatever, this, the, 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 the bombs as proper saying, or the bombs of Material nature in the form of threefold misery. There's no relief from that. We're going to be bombed by that, for sure. So, what is the point of being afraid? The point is, we are situated in the spiritual platform. And when we are situated on the spiritual platform, we are not afraid. We don't, still don't do stupid things. Uh, but Krishna consciousness begins from the platform of uh, real Krishna consciousness, begins from the platform of fearlessness. It's not that one is not Krishna conscious before that, but it's a very preliminary level of Krishna consciousness. Uh, the Japanese also who are threatening the Calcutta people with ruthless air raids for increasing their own happiness with possession of lands do not know that their happiness is also temporary and destructible as they have repeatedly experienced in their own fatherland. The living beings on the other hand who are designed to be killed are by nature eternal, impenetrable, invisible etc. So all those living entities who are threatened to be killed as well as those who are threatening to conquer are all alike in the grip of Maya potency and are therefore in the darkness. Today's conqueror will be tomorrow's loser because Maya is going to defeat everyone. So conquering, losing these things no, makes no sense because everybody is going to lose eventually. Abai wrote that never by their own devices could men escape the conditions of destruction so many world leaders were seeking relief from the war, but all were useless because their attempts for peace were within the material conception of life. Their attempts were like attempts to alleviate darkness with darkness, but darkness can only be removed by light. Without light, any amount of speculation of the human mind, which is also a creation of material nature, can never restore the living entities to permanent happiness. In that darkness, any method of bringing peace in the world can only bring temporary relief or distress. As we can see from all creations of the external potency, in the darkness, non-violence is as much useless as violence. While in the light, there is no need of violence or non-violence. So this is a very important point. In darkness, non-violence as much useless as violence. While in the it's all based on the bodily platform. While in the light, there is no need of violence or non-violence. Abai did not deal exclusively with the war. In theosophy ends in Vaishnavism. He criticized the shortcomings of the fashionable ideas of theosophy, which the followers of Madame Blavatsky had popularized in India. In congregation chanting, he upheld the scriptural prediction that the Sankirtan movement of Lord Chaitanya 
would spread to every town and village on the surface of the earth. From this foretelling, we can hope that the cult of Sankirtan will take sh very shortly a universal form of religious movement. Now, this is 1944. And Prabhupada, look at the faith that he has in Lord Chaitanya and our Acharyas. From this foretelling, we can hope that the cult of Sankirtan will take very shortly a universal form of religious movement. And this universal religion, wherein there is no harm in chanting the name of the Lord, nor is there any question of quarrel, will continue for years as we can know from the pages of the authoritative scriptures. So this is his faith in scripture. Shraddha. The central theme of Back to Godhead was clearly the order of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. In its cover with this picture of a thoughtful Shla Bhakti Siddhanta, in its dedication, in its statement of the magazine's purpose, in its handling of issues, its analysis of theosophy, its prediction of the spirit of Sankirtan, in its every aspect, the theme of Back to Godhead was the order of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. There are also four shorter essays by other contributors, including Bhakti Saranga Goswami, an advertisement on the back cover highlighted, Geet Upanishad by Abhay Charande, editor and founder, Back to Godhead, in three parts, notice 1,200 pages, royal size, first class Morocco binding. Now, this is uh, Robert's plan, he had only written an introduction, but this is Prabhupada's announcing his plan. An elaborate exposition of the world's famous Hindu philosophy, the Bhagavad Gita, in its true scientific theistic interpretations by the chain of disciplic succession from Sri Krishna, Brahma, Narada, Vyasa, Madhva, Madhavendra Puri, Ishwara, Lord Chaitanya, Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, Krishna Das, Narottama, Bishwanath, Baladev, Jagannath, Thakur Bhakti Vinod, Gaur Kishore, Thakur Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, down to the author, with numerous illustrations in colors and plain from many authentic scriptures. Prabhupada is very fond of illustrations. To be published shortly, customers booked in advance, price India, rupees 18, foreign, uh, one pound, 10 cents. And uh, a second major work, Lord Chaitanya in two parts, totaling 1,000 pages. Neither of these manuscripts was actually near completion. But Abhai was expressing his eagerness to undertake such large works on behalf of his spiritual master. In attempting to print the second issue of Back to Godhead, Abhai encountered the same difficulty as before. Twice he requested permission to purchase newsprint, and twice the government denied his request. Paper was restricted on account of war. On July 10th, 1944, Abai wrote a third letter. Look at Prabhu's determination. He just goes on. With due respect, I beg to submit that under the instruction of His Divine Grace, Sri Sriman Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, the spiritual head of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, I had to start a paper under the caption Back to God. The very name will suggest the intention of starting such a paper in the midst of heavy turmoil through which the world is now passing. A copy of the same booklet is sent herewith for your kind perusal. In that booklet, you shall find strong world opinions, even by many reputed politicians all over the world, in favor of such a movement to bring back the world into sanity by training the mind and educating human nature for the unshaking spiritual plane. Look at the expression that Prophet uses. You know. Bringing the world into sanity by training the mind and educating human nature for the unshaking, unshaking, that's the very nature of spiritual plane. It is not shakable. Unshaking spiritual plane, considered to be the supreme need of humankind. I hope you will kindly go through the paper by making some time and I may draw your attention, especially to the introductory portion. Abai also remarked that the editorial board of Back to God had felt that there was not so much a scarcity of paper as a scarcity of education. Taking the opportunity to preach, Abai explained that although the ultimate supplier was the personality of God, godless men consider themselves the proprietors of all things. Catastrophe that is now in vogue in the present war of supremacy is guided by this false sense of proprietorship. And therefore, there is a need of making propaganda amongst all human beings in, in order to bring them back to the sense of the ultimate proprietorship of Godhead.
Look at the uh, kind of efforts that Prabhupada makes. You know. Abai conceded that there might indeed be a paper shortage in India. I mean, to, to deal with the British with, during the time of war with paper shortage, how determined Prabhupada must have been to pursue the order of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. But in recent times, he wrote, enlightened Indians had regularly sacrificed tons of valuable ghee and grains in the fire during religious sacrifices. And in those times, there had not been any scarcity. People now, however, having abandoned all sacrifices to the Supreme Lord were producing only scarcity. Can we not therefore sacrifice a few reams of paper in the midst of many wastages for the same purpose in order to derive greater benefit for the humankind? I request that the government should take up this particular case in the light of spiritualism, which is not within the material calculation. Even in Great Britain, the government has immensely supported a similar movement called the Moral Rearmament Movement without consideration of the scarcity of paper, which is more acute there than here. Let there be a page only. Notice Prabhupada's final submission. Let there be a page only, if not more, for the publication of Back to God, for which we do not mind. But my earnest request is that the government should at least let there be a ventilation of the atmosphere for which my paper, Back to Godhead, is meant. Ventilation of the atmosphere. Very, very interesting expression. Kindly, therefore, give it a serious consideration and allow me to start even by one page every weekly, one page progress, petitioning. Kindly allow me one page every week or monthly as you think best without thinking it is ordinary waste of paper for the sake of humanity and Godhead. The letter was successful. Now with veiled sarcasm, he headlined his second issue, thanks to the government of India. He informed his readers, many of you whom had been disappointed to learn that the government had curtailed his printing, that he would be able to continue his magazine every month. Abai printed his letter to the government paper officer and also replying, granting him permission. His articles were shorter this time displaying the fair flair of a news columnist as with philosophical criticism, verb, and a touch of ironic humor, he commented on world leaders in crisis, Gandhi Jinnah talks, Mr. Churchill's humane world, and Mr. Bernard Shaw's wishful desire and spontaneous love of God and compromised, comprised the issue. Gandhi Jinnah talks. We are sorry to learn that Gandhi Jinnah talks about the unity of the Indian people have failed for the present. Abai was not very optimistic about the results of such occasional talks between several heads of communities. Notice that uh, it is within quotes, which means there is from the article. Even if they made a successful solution, it would break up and take the shape of another. For unity between Muslims and Hindus, but in Europe, the fighting parties were Christians, and in Asia, they were mostly Buddhists, but still they were fighting. So fighting will go on between Hindu and Mohammedan, between Hindus and Hindus or between Mohammedan and Mohammedan, between Christians and Christians, and between Buddhists and Buddhists, till the day of annihilation. So this cannot be stopped. It will keep on going. As long as there was a contaminated self-interest of sense gratification, there will be fighting between brother and brother, father and son, and nation and nation. Real unity would stand only on a plane of transcendental service to the Supreme. Mahatma Gandhi Abhay Road is far above ordinary human being, and we have all respect for him. But Gandhi had, Abai advised Gandhi to give up his activities on the material plane and rise to the transcendental plane of the spirit. Then there could be talks about the unity of all people. Abai cited Bhagavad Gita's definition of a Mahatma, one who concentrates their attention on the service of the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. He requested Mahatma Gandhi to adhere to the teachings of Bhagavad Gita and preach his message of surrender to the Supreme Personality of God at Sri Krishna. In this way, Mahatma Gandhi, through his influential position in the world, could bring about universal relief simply by preaching the message of Bhagavad Gita. So look at Prabhupada's boldness. He's telling Gandhi, preach the message of Bhagavad Gita. Mr. Churchill's humane world. We are pleased to find that leaders of world politics, such as Mr. Churchill, have nowadays begun to think of a humane world and trying to get, get rid of the terrible national frenzy of hate. Now, very important here, please note this. The frenzy of hatred is another side of the frenzy of love. The frenzy of love of Hitler's own countrymen has produced the concomitant frenzy of hatred for others. And the present war is the result of such dual side of a frenzy called love and hate. Red. So when we wish to get rid of the frenzy of hate, we must be prepared to get rid of the frenzy of so-called love. 
this position of equilibrium free from love and hatred is attained only when men are sufficiently educated a very important concept here uh, we generally think oh love is very good but proposition is actually as nonsensical as hate because that love creates hate as it happened with hitler unless men were educated to see the soul within the body the dual frenzy of love and hate would continue and a human world would not be possible this introspection abai concluded is easily attained by the service of god so mr churchill's humane world implies that we must go back to god act i remember when i was in school uh, sorry in college whenever i mean we would talk something i would always refer to krishna and bhagavad gita and people would say these hari krishnas whatever you talk to them on any topic they still bring it back to krishna so that is this is proper's method and this is supposed to be our own method also mr bernard shaw's wishful desire mr bernard shaw has con- congratulated mahatma gandhi on the occasion of the later 76th birthday in the following words i can only wish that this were mr gandhi's 35th birthday instead of his 76th we heartily join proper's writing mr shaw it is attempt to subtract 41 years of the present age of mahatma gandhi but death but death does not respect our wishful desire neither mr shaw nor mahatma gandhi nor any other great personality have had ever been able to solve the problem of death the leaders of nations have opened many factories for manufacturing weapons for the art of killing but none has opened a factory to manufacture weapons for protecting man from the cruel hands of death although our wishful desire is to always not always not to die men were preoccupied with the problem how to get bread although this problem was actually solved by nature man should try to solve the problem of death this is the point nature solves food problem man should solve the problem of death the same principle applies to devotees also we still simply think of earning for sake of bread and house and security and things that we are missing the point those problems are solved by nature of course we should work as much as necessary minimum but uh, or whatever is required but not over endeavor but real endeavor should go in the direction of how to solve the problem of death so proper is consistent in his message you can notice 1944 1965 there is no difference or 1965 to 70 1970 same thing same consistent prabhupa bhagavad gita tells that the problem of death can be solved although death is everywhere in the material world one who attains to me says krishna never has to take his birth uh, again in the material world there is a spiritual world non destructible and one who goes there does not come back to the region of death why should the leaders of nations cling to the planet of their birth where death is inevitable why should the leaders of nations cling to the planet of their birth where death is inevitable forget about nation even forget about the planet he's talking i mean what what is speak of uh, nation proper is saying let let us forget even about this planet why are we trying to make this planet a better place i mean to, for material enjoyment we should make it a better place by making everybody devotees not that we try to make it materially better so by concluding we wish that in their ripe old age mr shaw and mahatma gandhi will make combined effort to educate men to learn how to go back to home back to god so after two issues of back to god and abai had to stop printing was costly but he kept writing regularly working at gita upanishad turning out new articles and philosophical purports in scriptures even in the same book in which he wrote his pharmaceutical formulas although he could not publish them anymore okay so uh, that is how uh, proper tried for two i mean two issues he published to in the time then he had to stop then something happens here it is one night abai had a unusual dream shila bhakti siddhant appeared before him beckoning he was asking abai to leave home and take sanyas abai awoke in an intensely emotional state how horribly thought he knew that it was not an ordinary dream yet the request seemed so difficult and unlikely take sanyas at least it was not something he could do immediately now he had to improve the business and at the profits he would print books he went on with his duties but remained shaken by the dream so uh, this is after he, after the two two uh, magazines stop after the second issue stop he had this dream so uh, he he could not understand the dream of course he is a nitya siddha we cannot take it in the mundane sense so he thought okay 
I need to, I've done two magazines, I need to push it further. So he thought if he earns a lot of money, then he can push it further. So he leaves Calcutta and goes to Lucknow and begins his operations in Lucknow. In 1945, he goes to Lucknow. Okay, now before he goes to Lucknow, uh, there's one section which I do not cover here. Please go there. Well, we'll finish in time, don't worry. Just, uh, just looking at one section which I did not cover. After the Bhakti Vedanta title was confirmed, uh, a conferred on Prabhupada, Abhay continued regularly associating and he start, wrote an introduction article, right? Which after which he got that introduction to Gita Upanishad, the article he wrote, due to which he was conferred the title Bhakti Vedanta. So let's see what happened after that. Abhay continued regularly associating with Sridhar Maharaj and discussing with him, Srimad Bhagavad. Abhay, Abhay encouraged him to preach widely, although Sridhar Maharaj is admittedly more the scholar and rather shy about going out and preaching. On several occasions, Abhay tried to convince Sridhar Maharaj to go with him and charge Gandhi and Nehru after why they were following the principles of Bhagavad Gita. And this is what we saw Prabhupada did actually. You know, that uh, he tried to convince Sridhar Maharaj to go with him and uh, charge Gandhi and Nehru. Why weren't they following the principles of Bhagavad Gita? But when Sridhar Maharaj declined, so that's why Prabhupada had started this. Uh, he wanted to do it combinedly with Sridhar Maharaj. But when Sridhar Maharaj declined, then he started the Back to Garden magazine. And we saw how he's charging Gandhi and everybody else. And one more thing happened. Another foot of uh, the spiritual association at 7 Banerjee Lane was a book called Prapanna Jeevanamrita compiled by Sridhar Maharaj. A collection of verses from various Vaishnava scriptures, including excerpts from the works of Rupa Goswami, was divided into six chapters according to the six divisions of surrender. Six divisions of surrender, accepting things favorable, is one rejecting things uh, unfavorable is two um, always dependent on the mercy of the Lord to believe firmly in the Lord's protection have no interest uh, from the separate from the interest of the Lord and uh, to always feel meek and humble did I already say that uh, okay anyway say so there are these are the six divisions of uh, surrender so this is a Beautiful book, which is uh, Abhay, along with the sannyasis, the Devan and the Saraswati Mutt financed the public mutt public financed the publication. That is that it was that was that it was thus it was published as a joint effort by friends. This is the only joint effort that happened uh, with Prabhupada and the uh, sannyasis. There, they published this book together. But uh, when Prabhupada wanted Sri Maharaj to go and charge Gandhi and uh, others. With why they don't follow the principles of the Gaudi Gita, make try to inspire them, take up Bhagavad Gita. Then Sridhar Maharaj is not so inclined. So Prabhupada came up with the Back to God. And when after Back to God it collapsed, uh, not collapsed, it uh, Back to God did not collapse. It had to be stopped temporarily for the sake of uh, because there were no um, there is not enough money to print. Just give me a second. Now, in 1945, when Prabhupada moved to Lucknow, it was after the dream that he had of Bhaktisattva after he published the two Back to Garden magazines, and then also the dream of Bhaktisattva Saraswati. So he said, okay, he saw his Guru Maharaj appearing before him and urging him to take sannyas. So Srila Prabhupada thought, uh, let me earn money so that I can further his mission. Although he says he was shaken by the dream. <clears throat> In 1945, Srila Prabhupada moved to Lucknow. 
the idea was he there he hired a big place and uh, in that big place he spent invest 40000 rupees 40000 rupees during those days so his plan he had a really big plan to really uh, have a big pharmaceutical company abhay charan day and sons although it is called abhay charan day and sons the sons were not helping him neither was his brother helping him uh, proper that to practically run it on his own so um, eventually he could not pay his rent and also the landlord got into a litigation with proper okay so then proper himself captures this in two letters he writes a letter to a servant the notice the servant is called gauranga but proper address is as gauranga prabhu please accept my obeisances i received your letter dated 7th due to uh, uh, lack of time i could not this is 7th of november 1945 7th of november 1945 due to lack of time i could not reply in time i stay here alone with some servants if i leave now then i have to close everything down due to my leaving once and closing the business i have lost about 10000 rupees and the goodwill has also been affected and my enemies have increased that is why i am fighting practically staking my whole life i am staying here all alone in the middle of so many difficulties not for nothing that's why i is writing to you repeatedly to come here as soon as you receive this letter show to dubra dubra is a servant in proper house take at least uh you brought a servant or a financial assistant uh, i mean accountant take at least i don't know which one it is mm. take at least 10 rupees from him and come here when you come here i will make arrangements to send money to your home what's the point in holding you back with an excuse that there is no servant or maid servant because proper's family in calcutta were trying to hold him back uh goranga prabhu by saying that there's no servant or maid servant so proper saying what's the point in holding you back with an excuse that there's no servant or maid servant i have i try to serve them enough by keeping servants i try to serve them enough by keeping servants maid servants and cooks but up until today they have not become attracted attached to devotional service so i have no more interest about those affairs when you come here then i will go to calcutta if i see that they are interested about devotional service then only will i maintain my establishment there otherwise i will not maintain them any more bring a quilt for me yours bhai and then he replied and then proper replies to that reply from goranga offering my humble obeisances at the feet of the vaishnava goranga prabhu i have received your postcard dated 1811 1945 and got all the informations there is no need to come here just for a month after spending the money and then go back for the present take 25 rupees from dubra and go home write a letter to me after your arrival then i will send the rest of your money in one or two installments by money order then from there you let me know when you can come here i have started my work here in a fairly big scale you have seen that with your own eyes so if there is no income who will spend for a court interrogation everything is on my head the brother and sons are just eating and sleeping like a bunch of females well this would be considered extremely misogynistic if for the people of today but this is quite common uh well probably is writing um in 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 those days it's quite common to refer to say things like this brothers and sons are just eating and sleeping like a bunch of females what is referring to is the fact that they were not uh interested in running the business women generally during those times they were not into businesses and professions and things like that. they were generally homemakers uh so that's why that expression is used there the brothers and sons are just eating and sleeping like a bunch of females and breaking the axe on my head you go home as soon as you get money and try to come back as soon as possible yours shri abai charan dev so this is the situation as this chapter ends called the war okay it's a very interesting uh the next chap- next chapter we'll explore what happens this is a situation he's trying to earn money he's having difficulties there in lucknow meanwhile he's also trying he also has had a dream before going about this spiritual master ordering takes sanyas and preach okay so we are 5 minutes over time today we started 5 minutes late anyway i was on time but waited for everyone to join okay so if there are any questions can you unmute everyone 
No, not everyone. Whoever wants to. Yeah. But right now it's new talk mode, right? Okay, can you raise your hands if you have a question or you can type it on chat? Doesn't look like there are any. Yeah. Silesh Govinda Prabhu, you have anything to say? We missed hearing from you last class. No, okay. So I think we'll stop here for today. Uh, Krishna Prabhuji, sorry, I wasn't being unmuted. <laughs> My reputation is proceeding, but that's not good news that you're seeking questions from me. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I enjoy hearing from you. That's why I asked. You can see I'm smiling. I'm not, I'm not you can see my, I'm not frowning. I'm smiling. <laughs> Um, I do have a couple of questions, but I won't ask them today. If you may, if I may, Prabhuji, if I can ask next week, just because I've got, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, because it's Christmas, all my grandchildren are here, so there's a lot of background noise, so it'll be a little disruptive today. Um, no so if, I, if you don't mind, if I can hold the questions and ask you next week? No worries, definitely. definitely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for a wonderful class, Prabhuji. Okay, so I think we'll uh, stop here for today. Vanchakalpatarubhyasya kripasindubhya evacha paritanam pavanibhyo vaishnavibhyo namo.